Hello, people. Finished the book. A Distant Mirror by Barbara W. Tuchman. Tuchman? Very good book. Uh, I guess my only complaint is she kind of wanders a little bit. Uh, she covers a hell of a lot of ground. This is subtitled The Calamitous 14th Century. So I've read a little bit more about this. Uh, this kind of followed uh, the career of, you know, a baron or whatever the hell you want to call him, a Frenchman. His name was Cousy, C-O-U-C-Y. I have no idea whether I'm pronouncing that correctly or not. Cousy had a great big castle, uh, towns, land, farms. He owned all kinds of shit. He, he did take part in the government on several several instances. Uh, he led, you know, little miniature crusades. But this is also about the Hundred Years' War between France and, and England. A lot of stuff that I didn't know is in here. So it was a very good book. I think I'm done with 650-page books for a little while. This one was 634 pages. It took me like 20 days to get through this. 20 not-so-normal days. There's some fucked-up shit going on at my house. Uh, I do have some notes, as always. <laughs> my first note says forward. So it was in the forward, the second and third paragraph. But I neglected to write down what page that was. So, so I, I know you're disappointed, but I can't read those paragraphs for you. It, it had to do with the change between now and the 14th century. Uh, people are still religious now, but, but uh, they don't spend every waking moment thinking about it. There was some really crazy shit that happened in the 14th century. Uh, this is a birthday book. My birthday was in October. My son uh, took me to, to uh, Barnes & Noble. So this is a brand new book, which is a little bit unusual for me. Usually I get them at the, the used bookstore. Barbara is a prolific author. It, I googled, you know, the name, which is typical for me. She wrote Wake of the Plague, which I has, have read maybe within the last two years. It wasn't great, but it was good. And she wrote Guns of August. And, and uh, you know, hopefully I've read Guns of August. If I did, it was many years ago when I was wont to uh, read about World War I and World War II. So I'm pretty sure I read that. The Bubonic Plague appears in uh, the 14th century. This little history does go into the 15th century, too, like, like in the epilogue at the end. Uh, and, it, and it covers the 13th a little bit, too. But this is when the plague first appeared, and, you know, it returned several times. There was also famine. There was horrible weather. Uh, the flagellants made their appearance in the 14th century and, and they were fucking crazy uh, they everybody anytime something terrible happened they took it out on the Jews I, I don't know why the Jews would ever return to any of these towns but they did and uh, even the flagellants you know would massacre Jews you know the old poison the well thing uh, the battle of Portiers. Uh, the French king is actually taken prisoner by the English. The French are, are not very successful fighting on their own soil. And, and, and torturously, this author explains why. It's all the knights' fault. They won't fucking listen to commands. They, they, they want to charge ahead. You know, the English for a long time had a monopoly on, on very good archers and... Uh, 
uh, at the Battle of Portiers, the some of the English actually complain that the archers killed too many of the French knights because they wanted to uh, to ransom them off. Uh, okay, so I do have some reading to do. Second paragraph, page two hundred seven. Oh, okay, this is... They're talking about prisoners that they're trying to, to ransom off. They were required to live at their own expense, considerable in the case of the Duke de Orleans, who had 16 servants with him and a total retinue of over 60, handsomely entertained with banquets, banquets and minstrels and gifts of jewels, the hostages moved about freely and joined in hunting and hawking, dancing and flirting. French and English chivalry took pride in treating one another courteously as prisoners, however greedy the ransom. In contrast to Germans, who according to Frossart's scornful report, threw their prisoners in chains and irons like thieves and murderers to ex extort a greater ransom. Uh, you know, this, this hundred years of history that this, this author covers really barely mentions uh, the Germans, and when she does, it, it's something negative. So I don't think she cares for the Germans. Uh, 218, third paragraph. At the age of 12, Isabella's favored position was marked by her having seven ladies-in-waiting compared to Joanna's three. All seven with Isabella are reported arriving in Canterbury for a tournament in 1349 during the Black Death, wearing masks, presumably against contagion. And I think that's why I noted that paragraph. You know, even in the 14th century, some people were wearing masks. 224... Uh, Isabella could well have listened to the tales of Jeanne de Condé, poet in her lifetime at her mother's native court in Hainault. Uh, Hainault is some kind of a weird uh, French-German uh, area, probably right along the Rhine. His style is illustrated by a story about a game of truth-telling played at court before the, a tournament. A knight asked by the queen if he had fathered any children is forced to admit he has not, and indeed he did not have the look of a man who could please his mistress when he held her naked in his arms, for his beard was little more than the kind of fuzz that ladies have in certain places. The queen tells him she does not doubt his word, for it is easy to judge from the state of the hay whether the pitchfork is any good. <laughs> in his turn, the knight asks, Lady, answer me without deceit. <clears throat> Is there hair between your legs? When she replies, none at all, he comments, Indeed, I do believe you, for grass does not grow on a well-beaten path. I thought that was kind of funny. There's all kinds of stuff in here that I wanted to mark and I didn't. Uh, this is an American author, so when she does discuss the Habsburgs, she writes Habsburgs with a P instead of a B. And that's one of my pet peeves, man. It's fucking Habsburg, not Habsburg. Uh, second paragraph, 315. On the day before the end, the prince's last will was completed, adding to the detailed arrangements already made. Though death was but a flight of the soul from its bodily prison, it was customarily accompanied by the most precise care for bequests, funeral, tombstone, and every other aspect of earth, earthly, earthly remains. As if anxiety of what was to come sharpened reluctance to leave the world, the prince's instructions were usually detailed, his bed furnishings, including hangings embroidered with the deeds of Saladin, were left to his son. I marked that paragraph because Saladin was, was you know, so chivalrous that he was like a hero in, in Europe. And they had, you know, they had hangings of him. Uh, 
the poor of France revolt over taxes. And of course, that doesn't end well for the poor. When the taxes are abolished, the poor celebrate by killing Jews and looting the Jewish quarter. <laughs> uh, Dance of the Burning Ones. These people did some weird shit, and uh, there was a banquet for a marriage, and it was this woman's second marriage, and when it's a woman's second marriage, apparently uh, it's, it's a time for mockery of this woman. And these guys dressed up like like wild men of the forest, and they actually glued uh, hair and leaves all over their bodies, and they did it with a flammable substance, and of course everything's lit with candles, a bunch of them burned to death, uh, it's fucking crazy. Near the end of the book, there's a battle, uh, Nicopolis, this is when the, the Turks are making their yearly forays into Europe. You know, the Turks at one point, point make it all the way to Vienna. Uh, Kusi is in charge of, it's a crusade to, to help defeat the Turks. And Nicopolis is just a disaster for the Hungarians and the French. And Kusi is taken prisoner. And they march him back to fucking Turkey. And, and uh, he ends up dying there. The book covered a lot of ground towards the end. I kept hoping they would get to Joan of Arc because I, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the actual years of Joan of Arc. So in the epilogue, they do discuss, discuss uh, Joan of Arc, the end of the Hundred Years' War, and key events of the 15th century. It was a very good book. I'm going to put it on the shelf, and I'm probably going to be making another video today because I have a really short book, 132 pages, and it's a good book, and, and I've almost finished the fucking thing already. Thank you.